and welcome to Spilling the Milk, the podcast where we are serious about making things better for breastfeeding moms and babies, but we also don't take ourselves too seriously. And a happy National Breastfeeding Month to all. Of course, around here, we are always raising awareness around breastfeeding and how to better support moms, but it's also pretty cool that this is a nationally celebrated issue this month. If you enjoy this podcast, know that it is a production of Empowered Bumps and Boobs, and you're welcome to head over to empoweredbumpsandboobs.com for lots more resources on all things breastfeeding. Of course, our signature program, Empowered Breastfeeding Bootcamp, is open for enrollment, and if you head to the website, you can find lots more information on that. We would love to have you join us. It's an online space where you can not only learn about breastfeeding, but connect with other moms who are in it with you and you can ask your questions and you can get some reassurance that you're doing things okay. And as you'll hear in today's conversation, one of the best predictors of breastfeeding success is if moms have a support community and have that support around them, especially when they're first getting started. I am really excited for today's conversation. It is with Ava Naganan. I think I'm saying her name right. She is, um, she's from Ireland and she is working on something so exciting. I love disruptors. I love people who look at the status quo and say, mm, not good enough. And so that's what Ava has done. She has looked at the state of breast pumps, which literally suck. They use sucking technology, which is not how babies get milk out of breasts. Babies suckle, they don't suck. And the industry has just used basically the same technology, though there have been advancements with wearable pumps and electric pumps. But at the core, the technology really hasn't changed. And she saw this and said, not good enough, based on her own experience and then based on speaking with lots and lots of experts in the field of lactation, as well as moms who have you know, used pumps and have breastfed. And she's just very passionate about this issue and has thus far been able to develop a new type of breast pump using grant money. And at this point, they are ready to manufacture and bring this to market. And so to fund that, they're going the way of Kickstarter, a Kickstarter campaign, which I love because this needs to be a grassroots movement. Why would the big pumping companies want to put themselves out of business? That's how disruption works. They're not going to do it. They want you to keep buying the pumps that they have to offer you. But going directly to consumers, to the moms um, whose lives would be changed with a better breast pump solution I think that's the right way to go. And so I'm definitely going to be heading over to the Kickstarter campaign after recording this episode. I'm going to purchase one of the, I think one of the gift sets. So there's different levels that you can contribute. If you've never done a Kickstarter campaign, the way it works is you pledge uh, money to back this project. And when a certain date passes, in this case, October 10th, 2023, if the Kickstarter campaign has met its goal, monetary goal, enough people have pledged, then your card will be charged and you actually um, are contributing the money. If they don't meet the goal, then you aren't charged. So you would only end up investing in something that enough other people also invested in, which is kind of a good safety net and um, one of the keys to the, the success of Kickstarter itself as a platform. So without further ado, I want you to have a chance to hear from Ava directly. She's going to explain the technology, explain some, you know, some of the origin of where it came from, uh, the benefits of this type of pump compared to our traditional sucking pumps, and I think you're going to love her as much as I did. Take a listen. I'm a little bit overwhelmed and blown away because it seems like mm -hmm. what you're working on could be really life changing and sort of industry changing. Um, so I think without further ado, if you could just start with who you are, a little about your background, and then the specific project you're working on, just to give us some background. Yeah, yeah. So my name is Ava Nagyanan. I am the founder of Kala. Kala is, uh, as you say, a groundbreaking technology to uh, mimic the suckling action of the tongue of the infant. Um, 
my background is uh, originally in business. So I have a master's degree in economics and I worked in this field, especially with large EU funds for the majority of my career. And then we started a family, I became pregnant and I started my breastfeeding journey with my first son. And uh, I loved it. So I, I, I was uh, through and through a breastfeeding uh obsessed with breastfeeding I loved doing it of course I faced a lot of challenges as everybody else I suppose who is breastfeeding but uh, my biggest issue was with with breast pumps they never really worked for me and I remember being somebody who didn't have previous experience with breastfeeding or with pumps I was constantly thinking of like uh, oh am I do I actually have milk supply is my baby getting enough milk because I don't, don't see anything in the bottle and I tried with so many brands and inserts and different flange sizes and you know all I got was pain and no results for it either so mm-hmm. it was really really frustrating and then at, at one day I remember somebody in our Facebook group who was uh, a group of supporting mothers, supporting each other in breastfeeding, somebody posted this ultrasound video of an infant suckling. Mm -hmm. And you know that kind of undulating movement that the tongue is doing. And it was just like, oh my God, I know one thing for sure, this is not what my breast pump is doing. Right. You know, and that was, I think that was that pivotal moment where it just stuck in my mind and I started to read up about it more and more. And this kind of um, interest turned into something else because my husband is in medical devices. So was, he was looking from the side going, yeah, they really don't do that, do they? Like no matter what breast pump we looked at, they don't seem to be literally just the question is, does the breast pump have a tongue? You could easily say no. You know, it's so easy <laughs> to answer that question. I know there is a lot of talk about how they mimic the suckling pattern and anything what they can do with vacuum they try to do right. but at the end of the day there is no tongue there is no not that fundamental physical interaction with the breast that has been the trigger for our breast for millions of years you know that this this mm-hmm. fundamental key thing is missing and um yeah so we got a, a small funding to kind of do a proof of principle Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to see whether if it's at all possible to translate this um, idea or knowledge into a device. And we got positive results from that initial test. So the University of Galway was kind enough who and, and interested enough to understand that, yeah, this is something fundamentally important. So mm-hmm. we received a two-year funding from them where we worked with engineers, scientists, uh, medical professionals, to pin down exactly the the actions of the suckling tongue and translate it into technology. Wow, that is so cool. Um, I guess being sort of on the other side of all that development, what surprised you or maybe um, what big lessons did you learn just from going through that whole process of creating a new product? Oh, there are so many, (laughs) so many, but I suppose the the biggest, the hardest part, let, let's say this 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 way, that like uh, the what the tongue it does is extremely complex. Mm. Uh, the tongue itself is such a agile organ; uh, it can twist internally. If you just think about it, how we are able to speak and turn our tongues in such complex ways. The same way with suckling, there are so many parts to the tongue that does absolutely different things at the same time. Uh, to create this complex motion of the suckling. Mm -hmm. Um, So pinning down those functions was one part, but trying to combine those functions, we identified five key functions. I might mention it here, the latch, compression, sequence, vacuum, and the positioning. These are the five key elements of it. They need to work in perfect harmony to, to emphasize each other. And that was really hard. That was really hard to make, combine them in a way that they actually um, enhance <laughs> and create the the, the wanted effect uh, as opposed to just bypass each other. So mm-hmm. that was, I suppose that was the hardest. There are like hundreds of different trial and errors and, and modelings that need to be, right? This is not the perfect, we have to, we have to go back and do it again. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a much bigger, um a fundamental thing then then by the look of it just look at it and you see uh an undulating wave-like motion 
Mm-hmm. That's just the surface. And we were very uh, determined that we're not just going to create something that looks like suckling. You know, it's not like we don't want to just kind of tick the box of like, yeah, this is this this from the far. It does look like what the infant is doing. We were very keen on define exactly what is the functionality of these uh, specific parts, you mm-hmm. know, to make it actually work like suckling, not just look like it. So it sounds like you were sort of affirming how miraculous the human body is to start with because you were trying to mimic it and it wasn't so absolutely, easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were absolutely amazed by, by, you know, the sophistication of it. You know, mm-hmm. We went through about 120 research papers to start with and ultrasound images, of course, ultrasound videos and a lot of interviews with lactation consultants, mothers. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a great deal of expertise and experience poured into this. But yeah, the, just the amazement of, of how the body and the interaction between the infant's tongue and the mother's breast, this, this kind of super sophisticated, delicate um, interaction, uh, connectivity is, is amazing. And the more we went into it, of course, the more we were frustrated by how much breast pumps are able currently currently able to ignore all that Mm. um just because they work to some extent so there is no real um um alternatives out there that could highlight the shortcoming of the current devices Mm -hmm. right we just take it for granted that that's the only option and so many women rely on pumps if you're going to be away from your baby if you're going to work away from your baby and it's really important for you to keep feeding breast milk, you have to use a pump or you could express manually, but that's not quite as efficient. Um, I guess, could you speak to, because I think what you're developing right now is a form of a manual pump. So maybe explain how um, that aspect works. Yeah, so we decided for a manual pump to to produce uh, a manual pump, uh, the technology itself. And it's something that fits inside the bra. So it kind of have this half dome, or teardrop shape that fits inside the bra and you can uh, squeeze it from the side from, uh, outside your clothes so you don't have to sort of go mm-hmm. under your clothes to to um to make it work you just kind of squeeze through your clothes from the yeah. sides mm-hmm. um so if you kind of squeeze smaller ones that's like the stimulation that uh, that mimics the stimulation of the infant tongue and then if you squeeze bigger ones that's when the milk, ex- milk expression starts so it's it we like the idea of a manual pump because it has a direct um, feedback between mm-hmm. your hand and what's happening, you know, so you are more in control of yeah. how deep, how fast uh, you would want to do it. So we are, mm-hmm. we are always kind of happy with that idea. Uh, so it's super simple. And after you finish, you take it out and pour out the milk from the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I feel like when you're breastfeeding, you're always sort of like grabbing your bra. Like, you know, if you have a clogged duck, you're always sort of like working out over your clothes. So I can picture like it's not that different to just be over the clothes, like pumpy. And you could do it in the car. You could do it. You know, if you had an office, you could just do it in your office. Like, I love that because when I saw all the wearable pumps come to market um, sort of after I was done breastfeeding, I thought, oh, what a game changer. Yeah. Um, to be able to be pumping while you're still wearing your clothes. So it sounds like your technology still takes advantage of that. Um, same that nice same here. Same yeah. here. I miss the boat. I miss the boat of the wearable <laughs> breast pumps as well. But I, I, I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved the idea. And I f- felt like it's a game changer. But at the same time, there is no manual pumps that are wearable. And manual pumps, manual pumps are so important to have. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think we, we were bringing... Uh, for me, uh, I felt like having a wearable breast pump is now standard you know like that that's mm-hmm. the that's the starting point you would yeah. you don't want to go back uh, to a, a previous model than than the wearables uh so yeah we were keen to uh, to make sure that our technology sits in a wearable model mm-hmm. and you um when you first started speaking you mentioned that you encountered some challenges with your own breastfeeding journey so i was just curious what came up for you um there i think for for me with the breastfeeding itself the biggest was the doubt of am i doing it right is Mm -hmm. the baby feeding enough although i felt like he was constantly uh, breastfeeding he was Mm -hmm. non-stop but still is he gaining enough so i suppose um 
I didn't encounter many, so like I didn't had a, um, engorged breasts or just very basic ones. If I could feel it, I could put the baby on it and he took care of it. So there wasn't any major issues. He was tongue tie at the start, but that was noticed pretty fast. And uh, our local doctor was able to uh, treat that. Mm -hmm. So he was very good at latching. He was very good at um, the breastfeeding. So we, ha we had generally a good experience. Uh, the biggest was these doubts that set mm -hmm. in. You know, and when he's crying and you're thinking, oh, uh, is he not getting enough milk or what's going on? The, I think I suppose this was the biggest one. And um, I had great support around me through the breastfeeding support groups that I was part of at that time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as um, kind of structured as nowadays. Like you can see a lot of groups and even public health nurses organizing breastfeeding groups. So I think the idea of supporting mothers during their breastfeeding journey has become more important. And I'm so happy to see that. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it was more an informal group of moms uh, helping each other out and just, you know, tapping us on our shoulder going, you're doing fine. You're fine. Yeah. Don't worry. You know, I think that's the biggest and most important message a mom could get on their I first agree. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of at the core of my approach. Um, so I run a breastfeeding boot, empower breastfeeding boot camp. And of course, it's a lot of information about the nuts and bolts of how to feed and, you know, supply, building supply and, and all that. But the biggest impact, I think, is um, when I hold a live session of moms together and it's a safe space to just share what you're anxious about or the questions you have and hear from other people like, I'm anxious about that, too, or I was anxious about that. And then here's, you know, how I kind of handled it. And I hear so often even for moms who are still pregnant, the baby's not here. They haven't even tried breastfeeding yet. I'm worried I won't make enough milk. Oh my gosh, where did this fear come from? You have no evidence. This is their first baby. They have no evidence. Yeah. They've heard maybe from other people that had babies in the, around them. I had supply issues or I had to supplement. They just hear these things and then it becomes, well, then I'm probably not going to make enough. And then immediately well, how soon should I start pumping to make sure at least I'm pumping out enough milk for the baby? There's like this fundamental distrust mm -hmm. that just mom, boob, baby, we can figure this out. Um, and a lot of people jump right to the pump. Um, I'm I'm going to guess yeah. what you're developing. Um, you don't want it to replace nursing sessions. It's still important for mom and baby to build that together. But in an instance where a pump could be useful, that's when you know you would bring it in. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. If anything, quite the opposite. I would like to I would like our breast pump to be able to elongate uh, the journey of breastfeeding, you know, to to make the make supply last longer and being able to mom and baby spend more time together breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And even on the other side of um of moms getting, I mean, those moms who start straight away in breast pumps, I've heard that that's in the US, sometimes it's, it's, um, it's common because moms are planning to go back to work, and they wouldn't want to put their babies through the stress of having to uh, come off the breast mm -hmm. so early. So they start off with uh, pumping um, from the get go. And for their breasts to have the same experience as breastfeeding, from the get-go, I think that makes even a transition. If they decide, okay, you know what, I will breastfeed my baby. I decided I breastfeed my baby, not just pump. That transition will be so much easier and so much better for both of them. So I thought that bringing that experience way closer to how it feels with the baby is definitely helping the breastfeeding journey to be better and longer. That 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 is my aim, <laughs> definitely mm -hmm. not to replace it. Oh, my God. That would be the yeah. last thing on my mind. <laughs> right. But that is, yeah, I hear a lot of women jumping straight to, it's most important that I figure out how to successfully pump. Um, and I think there's some reassurance how you can see in the bottle that you have two ounces. And when you're mm -hmm. feeding, like you were saying, there is doubt. You don't know exactly how much they're getting. Yeah. It, at first, it's hard to tell if they're full. And also with nursing, do they want to nurse because they want comfort? Is it they just need a little bit to get to sleep? It's not. Um, it's not just about calories. And exactly. So that's, it's not that's just about the learn. intake. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. It's about the connection between the mother and the baby. 
So I think that's hugely important. And and I would like I really would like to see that 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 connection stays longer because they're using a pump that is closer to how nature does it. So mm-hmm. the mass the the max supply is likely to be longer as well. Yeah, and it would just reduce the the stress because um, a lot of women who go back to work and pump hate it. They hate mm-hmm. the pumping sessions. They're mm-hmm. like dreading it. Um, and so if we could take away that dread, that would be a game changer too, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, breastfeeding when it's working fine, I'm not saying it's always working fine. I had babies biting my nipple as well, but (laughs) it's, it is generally speaking, the way nature created it is a comfortable experience because it had to be a comfortable experience because nature had to make sure that moms are breastfeeding their babies for uh, at least six months or more until the baby is able to eat something else, right? right. So it's 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 designed to be comfortable, and uh, it's super necessary. And breast pumps don't do that. And like even mm-hmm. the pain and discomfort is such a such a standard, or it's a thing that we now take it for granted with breast pumps. It's it's almost like not even a question. It's like oh yeah, breast pump, of course they are hurt. Yeah, it's 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 a matter of fact. As opposed to, hang on, is there something wrong there? What best moms do? Uh, you know, if if I ask these questions from moms, I love that question because it's, it's again, um, you know, it just highlights the point. Does breast pumping feel like breastfeeding? And I, I, I had to hear a mom saying, yeah, it does feel like breastfeeding yeah. <laughs> because they don't. They don't feel like breastfeeding. And if they don't feel like breastfeeding, that they are not the right trigger for our breasts. Yeah, no, that's so true. That's so true. Um, And then, so um, I see you have a podcast, Letdown Podcast. And could you explain a little bit about how that came to be, how you first started to be recording, the types of guests you have on, and maybe some of your biggest takeaways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that kind of developed the same way uh, or at the same time when we were working at the university, because as we were digging deeper, the frustration was growing as well, of course, uh, around how much um, moms are sort of left alone in Mm. the breastfeeding journey. And I know that there is a great deal of support out there from breastfeeding organizations and public health nurses and all of that for breastfeeding itself, but from a society level, from a society's perspective, it's still kind of looked at as like a mother's uh, choice. And with that implied a mother's responsibility, like as if Mm. there is no collective responsibility to be had here. Um, And that's why, you know, still many moms experience uncomfort when they're feeding in public or still this, um, we have the marketing uh, formula marketing that is so, Mm sly can I use that word I'm not sure Mm. to to set in doubt into a mother's mind about their breastfeeding abilities there are so many other factors on a societal level that are not so talked about but it's super influential on the mother's journey on how long breastfeeding is going to last Mm-hmm. And so the podcast is, that's why it's called Let Down Podcast, is uh, the many ways the, the society un, unwillingly, it's not like they choose to, but it's still there. Uh, so many ways letting moms down in their journey, breastfeeding journey. So what I do on the podcast is I invite guests, um, scientists, uh, policymakers, anyone who has uh, an influence on mm-hmm. what surrounds the mother the mothers and their babies and we chat about where we can improve what we have at the moment what is the current situation and how we can improve it and what um because you've had quite a few episodes what are some of the themes that keep maybe keep coming up like you've had multiple guests sort of say the same thing to you oh yeah 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 a lot of them are coming up um um there's a lot of uh impact of the immediate cultural surrounding of the mother so like mm-hmm. the importance of the immediate surrounding and the support uh, that moms get there like the uh, the the family members mm. the community that surrounds them that's extremely influential from what i hear from my guests and it comes up a lot um 
the the effect of the formula marketing that comes up a lot as well how mm. of course there are now the baby friendly initiative in the hospitals which is great where they don't allow formula samples to be distributed okay. but still in many hospitals the moment you step out uh, from the hospital you have a goodie bag uh, mm. for the hospital including a formula a sample formula and even just that thought of like yeah you know what do your breastfeeding but you know there's the formula just in case even okay. then just in case is enough sometime on a, on, a, on a late evening when a baby is not feeding properly to mom just to kind of turn to the formula as opposed to to a support group or so, call up somebody who could help, right? So yeah. it's it, these tiny things. So that comes up a lot. The cultural aspect comes up, up a lot. Um, the lack of education in the general practitioners like doctors and nurses mm -hmm. so you have your lactation consultants but a lot of, in a lot of cases when a mom has issues with breastfeeding or just have an issue any kind of issue with the baby mm -hmm. they go to visit the doctor and the doctor wouldn't necessarily have the wouldn't necessarily be prepared uh, to recognize the signs that there are issues with lactation mm. so and they don't make the link to refer them the mother to a lactation specialist. Uh, mm -hmm. So the education that is missing there, that's um, that's that was one of the topics and and that was coming up a few times in different mm -hmm. forms. Yeah, I've heard of multiple moms who will leave a pediatrician's office in tears because they're getting the message from the pediatrician, like maybe you should just supplement or like, yeah you know, just feed the baby formula and that like, they're not getting any sort of support or empowerment or, or even a referral, it sounds like. So I've heard, I've heard that too. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I suppose it's true. And, and, and how big a doubt can that set in a, mind, a mom's mm -hmm. mind when a medical professional telling you that? Right. Yeah. And just the act of podcasting, because I've been doing it for a couple of years now, too. What have you learned along the way about, you know, having these conversations or just putting out a podcast? Well, what I, putting out a podcast is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that much. Mm -hmm. I also learned that um, it's... Um, yeah, like it, it's not easy to kind of come up with questions on the spot and <laughs> focus on all the other aspects of running and, and recording and mm -hmm. making sure all the technicalities are in place. Uh, but also what I find reassuring now, I might be living in a bubble because I'm speaking with, with people who are all uh, devoted advocates for breastfeeding, but there mm -hmm. seems to be like a great deal of positive improvement Mm -hmm. And uh, in everything, like if you just think of the Pump Act, the most recent uh, uh, passing of the Pump Act, I think that's a phenomenal result and victory for moms uh, who go back to work. Um, but there seems to be like a great deal of positive uh, improvement in situations and understanding mm -hmm. of these barriers and, and also how to have to break them down especially the cultural ones i find that there is a great deal of understanding there now as well and help so i i feel much better than i did before i started the podcast about where we are at and how we are supporting our mothers not forgetting that there's still a lot to do there's still a lot yeah. to do and i feel like with the pump i am able to do one aspect one important aspect because it's really as i say so many moms go back to work rely on these devices so having a yeah good enough device is just not acceptable as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. We need close to perfect and the best way to start is look at nature, how nature does it. Mm -hmm. And for mom to get to the point where she's returning to work and still breastfeeding, there has to be the support around her at the very beginning to help establish the milk supply. So I can see like, right, you're working on one piece of it, but you're very interested in knowing the big picture of the new mom experience yeah absolutely that's how i see it like breast pump is one aspect of this big picture we need to move make moves on every aspect of this big picture the pump is one that i can do personally mm -hmm. and and the rest of it i can do by promoting and um, making space for for the real advocates who come to the podcast and talk about about their work and what they're doing mm -hmm. that's fantastic and so 
we're very excited. Would you like to share with everyone um, what just launched this week, last week, very, very recently? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very recently, we just launched our uh, Kickstarter fundraising campaign, which is open for all the moms and everyone who understands the struggle that moms go through with pumps. We really want to rewrite how breast pumps work and put the action of the suckling tongue in the middle of the future technologies that come out with breast pumps. Um, so the Kickstarter is a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, you can go there and support us in whatever way we can. For moms who are looking for breast pump, it's a perfect opportunity because they can get uh, the Kala wearable manual of breast pump through this campaign, and that's a way they can support us. The pump is not ready straight away, of course, uh, so the campaign itself is going to fund uh, the manufacturing process. So the pump is ready. We just need to put through the manufacturing process and establish the distribution for it. That's what we're going to use the funding for. Uh, so the pump is expected to come uh, out in June next year. So mm -hmm. they can secure it now and they will receive it in nine months time, which might seem like a long time, but um, it's for $50. Actually, it's 50 euros. So whatever the equivalent in dollars is, I think mm -hmm. it's $55. It comes down to there are different packages. If you are a partner and you would like to surprise your loved one, there's a gift set uh, that comes with extra goodies. So I really would like to encourage everyone to come and support us because this is the time when we can really make a change in the breastfeeding industry and breast pumping industry. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you're pregnant right now, if you recently had a baby or if you're planning to have one soon, you would likely still be needing a breast pump in June. So it makes total sense to invest today. And then for those of us who might not need a breast pump per se, there are options on there to just donate because you know this is really important work. Um, and like you said, this could change the future of, um, you know, breast pumping technology for years to come. So it's a cool way to be involved. And I speak to so many moms who are sort of past the, um, the birthing and the breastfeeding phase themselves, but they have such a love and compassion for it wanting to be better for the next generation. They still are sort of processing through some of the traumatic experiences they went through. And they say like, oh my gosh, if, you know, things had been different and, or now I have a daughter, now I have a niece, like I would love for things to be better for her. And so this is a concrete way you can, um, you know, put your money where your mouth is and invest in this technology that could really be a game changer, help women nurse longer, um, continue nursing, you know, if they're going back to work. Um, and just provide more options and um, something that's more comfortable. So I'm super passionate. Obviously, I'm going to be investing in the Kickstarter campaign. We'll post about it on our social media and um, I'll do a blog post about it. And and we'll have a link in these show notes for people who want to head over and, um, and donate. And I'm excited to follow the journey, too. This is just exciting. Obviously, you are a woman bringing this technology to market. I'm going to go ahead and guess that there's a lot of like male executives behind most of the traditional breast pump companies. I could be wrong. There's probably females too, but we can say for sure this was designed like with a lot of input from, you know, people who have actually nursed a baby. Yeah, that's true. Our lead engineer as well. She's a mom. She, she, when she started with us, she wasn't a mom and then she became one and just kind of skyrocketed with her <laughs> input yeah. and expertise. Yeah. Yeah. So was she using it herself? Like the prototypes? Yes. Well, she, well, as as far as we are, we were able to, you know, like there's a lot of restrictions from regulatory mm -hmm. perspective of what we are able to do with a prototype. Yeah. But yeah, like it's it's exciting. It's exciting. That's what that's that's how much I can say. <laughs> that's fantastic. Is there anything we didn't get to cover yet today that you were hoping to share? No, I think we covered everything and I'm I'm very excited. I'm I'm very thankful for you to to spread the word uh and we I really hope I'm really hopeful that we will be able to make a change. And we should say <clears throat> you would like um everyone to visit the Kickstarter campaign before October 10th, is that right? That's correct. Yes. So it started last Friday. It's open for 60 days. And there's also maybe I should mention that there's a limited number of pumps available. Mm. There is enough plenty out there so don't worry but still there's a limited number so if you would like to get your pump then this is a good time to go sure and i think i might just buy the gift set and knowing that i'm sure someone's going to get pregnant and have a baby in the next nine months <laughs> and i've got my baby shower gift ready to go so go. perfect perfect thank you so much emily it's so much All appreciated right. thank you Eva.
If you would like to support the Kickstarter campaign that Ava told us about, you can go to kickstarter.com, and if you search for Kala, C-A-L-L-A, uh, her campaign will come up, and you can choose to just donate money if you want, or you can pre-order one or two of the pumps themselves for yourself or as a gift, and know that you are funding the next generation of how women can pump breast milk out of their breasts, and I'm all for options. Um, I think we have some different options. Breast pumps have seen some innovation recently in terms of wearables and things like that, but the more options, the better, and just to get the conversation started that um, maybe we need to be mimicking the baby suckling instead of just using a vacuum suction. So I'm excited. I'm going to go head over and contribute to the campaign. If you would like to be on Spilling the Milk and share with us, please reach me at emily at empoweredbumpsandboobs.com. You can follow us on Instagram at empoweredbumpsandboobs. And on our Instagram profile, you will see information about Empowered Breastfeeding Bootcamp and how you can sign up for a free course preview. We offer an affiliate program for doulas and other women's health workers if you want to help us get Empowered Breastfeeding Bootcamp into the hands of the moms who really need it. Um, we would love to partner with you. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. That will help boost us to the top when people are searching for breastfeeding information. Until next time, take care. 